Tamastu ma vid vishavahai Om Shanti 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 May the divine being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the divine being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om peace, peace. Peace be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. And so once again, good morning and namaste everyone. Welcome to our Sunday gathering and conversation. <clears throat> There's just this for announcements. There'll be some other announcements in the e-news and on the uh, Facebook page and on the website, but just this, uh, the birthday celebrations for Swami Vivekananda and Swami Brahmananda, because they follow the lunar calendar will be in early February this year. So you'll be receiving plenty of notice when, when uh, those uh, pujas will take place. And uh, I know uh, because he was just here for Mother's Puja that uh, Aditya is looking forward to serving as Pujari. So Mother willing, that's what will happen. All right. January is a month for the study of bhakti yoga. A bhakti yogi, a bhakta, has a devotional relationship with God. This is developed over time by study, prayer, ritual, and worship. As a bhakta, you practice giving every action, thought, emotion, perception, and tendency, a Godward turn. Everything you are, both positive and negative, is offered to the divine presence. Your prayer is for the carefree, self-surrender of a child in its mother or father's arms, and ultimately, union with your beloved. ultimately union with your beloved. The immersion of your selfhood in the great, greater sense of self. As Swami Yogeshananda used to say, consciousness is primary and not plural. So our perception of it as plural, while deliberate, is only a lesser truth or a partial truth. This morning we will hear about two, one person a saint, the other an avatar, an incarnation of God who achieved that total immersion and yet stayed to offer us the fruits of their spiritual journey. In the Devi Mahatmyam, the Devi Mahatmyam is 700 verses in praise of the Divine Mother. In the Devi Mahatmyam, also known as the Chandi, 
chapter 4, verse 9, we read, O Devi, you are Bhagavati, the supreme Vidya, which is the cause of liberation and great inconceivable penances are the means for your realization. You, the supreme knowledge, are cultivated by sages desiring liberation, whose senses are well restrained, who are devoted to reality and have banished all the blemishes. I'm sorry, have shed all the blemishes. Cultivated by sages desiring liberation, whose senses are well restrained, who are devoted to reality and have shed all the blemishes. As we study the lives of divine incarnations, we find that their spiritual unfoldment is described by this verse. They and some of the saints who become their perfect reflections are capable of great inconceivable penances. Yet we discover that as they struggle and suffer over many years, they are not doing it for themselves. Sages, saints, and avatars endure these trials so that they can share their spiritual treasures with us. Swami Vivekananda wrote of Sri Ramakrishna, all thine austerities were practiced for our sake. How great was thy sacrifice, freely choosing thy birth in this prison, our iron age, to unchain us and set us free. To unchain us and set us free. This morning we will review and discuss the Master Sadhana and the spiritual journey of the Roman Catholic saint and mystic, John of the Cross. We'll start with John of the Cross so that we can see how these saints actually do suffer great penances and yet are triumphant in their realization and in their ability to share. Now there's going to be a great deal of reading this morning because I don't, there's no sense of me trying to tell you something that has already been very well expressed by uh, others in writing. So I'm going to read with some interpolations and commentary as we go along. So we'll start with St. John of the Cross. He wrote, my soul is a candle that burned away the veil. Only the glorious duties of light I now have. St. John of the Cross was born in 1542 and died in his 49th year uh, in 1591. He has long been recognized as one of the world's great mystical poets. His verse reveals a profound, tender experience of divine communion. His father was from a wealthy silk merchant family that disowned him when he married a poor orphan girl possibly of Moorish descent from Toledo. <clears throat> In his compassion, he married a poor Moorish, that is Islamic girl. And so his family disowned him. Then St. John's father died when he was quite young leaving his mother and three sons in deep poverty. His mother was a weaver and John became a carpenter, painter, and tailor to help support the family. 
Well, in his teens, they moved to a larger and more prosperous city where he worked for a while in a hospital. It was during this period that he received his first formal education at a Jesuit school. He was an exceptional student, learned Latin well. This was a Spaniard. He learned Latin well and stayed in this school until the age of 21. Then, without much consultation with anyone, he became a Carmelite friar and subsequently spent four years at the University of Salamanca. When St. John was 25 years old, a decisive event occurred in his life. He met St. Teresa, St. Teresa of Avila, also a Spaniard. He met St. Teresa and was remarkably affected. One could say transformed by her. She was in her fifties and emanated great spiritual power and insight. It is believed that they fell in love in the purest sense with each other. It is reported that she once remarked of St. John, he was the most angelic human being I have ever encountered. And now we'll find out how he became such an angelic being. In 1568, John ag agreed to start the first reformed monastery for Carmelite friars in a dilapidated farmhouse that Teresa had received from a benefactor. In 1572, he became the confessor for the nuns at the, at the, of the convent of the Incarnation in Avila, where St. Teresa had been appointed prioress. In 1577, as a result of the attempted reform of the Carmelite order and his alliance with St. Teresa, he was kidnapped and imprisoned. It was during this period of debased confinement and torture by his fellow priests that he miraculously composed some of his greatest poetry. For much of the nine months St. John was in prison, he was confined. Now, you talk about penances. Just give a listen to this. For much of the nine months St. John was in prison, he was confined to a tiny cell, actually an unlit closet in which he could not even stand up. He was left to relieve himself on the floor of this tiny cell and his few scraps of food and water were sometimes thrown into his feces and urine. On a regular basis, he was brought from his cell and beaten by some of the other priests to the extent that he became permanently crippled. He was not given a change of clothes or allowed to wash for months. He became infested with lice and developed acute dysentery. He was forced to sleep upon his own excrement. This prison was in the basement of a monastery. One night in prayer, asking God for the strength to endure his confinement and torture, St. John had this remarkable experience or vision. He heard a duet in which God and he were the singers. I am dying of love, darling, what should I do? And the beloved responded, then die, my sweetheart, just die. Die to all that is not us. What could be more beautiful? The prophet Muhammad once said, die before you die. Speaking of an important transformative juncture through which we will all pass. My soul is a candle that burned away the veil, 
says St. John, the veil being that which separates us from God. The veil being faults, the untruths we, the veil being the faults, the untruths we believe that we must someday die to before we are born. Following this vision, life changed remarkably for St. John for a while. He was given better care and even pen and paper by a new jailer and during the next few weeks wrote down some 30 stanzas of his Cantico Espirituel, spiritual songs, and completed La Fonte, which is the fountain, and probably Noche Oscura, the dark night which is really a love poem about transformation. On the eve of the Assumption of the Virgin, the head of the monastery pulled St. John from his tiny cell and hideously beat him, promising that he would be released if he would just abandon the reform movement. That night, the Virgin appeared to St. John, filling his cell. The Virgin is Mary, the mother of the divine. That night, the Virgin appeared to St. John, filling his cell and heart with a divine comfort and saying, my darling, I have accepted your surrender to all that has happened here as you believed it was God's will, but now I command you to escape. And within a few days, he miraculously did escape. The most prolific period of his life followed his imprisonment. In solitude, surrounded by the clarity and beauty of the Andalusian landscape, he came to know days of heaven on earth. On December 14th, 1591, just before midnight, St. John lying near death and remarkably weak, wanted to fix his bed as if someone important were coming to visit. He then asked that the Song of Songs be read and while he was listening, suddenly he exclaimed, so beautiful are the flowers, and died. <clears throat> so many penances, can you imagine? Would we be able to endure such penances and keep our faith? Would we be able to endure a fraction of that and keep our sanity? Mm -hmm. But what do these great ones do it for? Why do they do it? Listen to this from St. John. This earth abode You let my suffering cease, for there was no one who could cure them. Now let my eyes behold your face, for you are our only love. My spirit's body is rising near, this earth a bow that shot me. Now lift me into your arms as something precious that you drop. My only suffering from this day forth will be your divine beauty, and you will constantly clear my, you will constantly cure my blessed sight each time you bring your face soon, so near to mine and call me bride. Do not be sad, my old friends. Look, these wings are finally stretched and laughing. Our souls are rising near to you, this earth of bow that shot us. 
Now lift me into your arms, dear God, like something precious that you drop. So this is the story of St. John of the Cross, a bit of the story, and just a bit of his beautiful poetry. Before we go on to Sri Ramakrishna, I always like to hear and let us all hear anything that you have to say, any questions you might want to ask, anything that you might like to say in the way of conversation about what you just heard. Anything at all about uh, first the Devi Mahatmyam, what it says about these great inconceivable penances are the means for the realization of the divine. and how these great ones suffer these penances and then pass their love and their spiritual treasure on to us. Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. This is Janaki. Yes, Janaki. Uh, I always feel kind of uneasy when I hear about the suffering of St. John of the Cross and others because it makes me feel, and I, I know what you're gonna say and I wanna hear you say it. <laughs> it makes me feel like I could never do that and I, I, I'm not asked to do that. But it, I feel like, is that the way that this uh, spiritual progress happens? Is, is that what's required? As we'll hear next week, the title of next week's talk is Itty Bitty Austerities. Mm -hmm because these great ones pass on not just their wisdom but their spiritual power to us we do not need to endure they do it for us and we'll hear about that in some detail at the end of this talk when uh, i read breaker of this world's chain no it is not expected of us Thank you, Brother Shankar. And, and for us to even think for a moment that it is expected of us, something is wrong if we're not suffering in that way, is simply a misperception. No. May the divine being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the divine being support and nourish us as a mother and father. We are, the, we are the children that are not required to do this. I got something to add. Yes, please. Um, how did they endure such inconceivable torture and hideous conditions and all that? That has a very close connection, I think, with their commitment to truth, because it is their faith in that love for God and love for truth. Just like Gandhiji went to oppose the world's worst apartheid government in South Africa and in India, and in the, in, in the prison, they went through not these uh, <laughs> intolerable tortures, but many, many such tortures. But because of their commitment to truth, what we call adherence to truth, which is Satyagraha, that's in the, he gave. I think that gave them spiritual power to endure because they did it for others they did listen it listen to what the divine mother says to saint john of the cross 
the Divine Mother in the form of Mary said, My darling, I have accepted your surrender to all that has happened here as you believed it was God's will. Yes, God's will, but yes. there's deep faith in that. Yes. That commitment oh, to... Beyond, beyond faith, beyond, beyond ordinary faith. Yes. Because this, is, this is how they're able to endure this. And did not you say that he refused to give up what he was doing, reformation? So oh, exactly. He continued. So he was committed to truth. That's how. Yes. 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 He would not give up his yes. commitment to reforming the yes. corrupt, corrupt, clearly corrupt Carmelite. Very much. The order, the order, as as happens, mm -hmm. that order of monks had become corrupt. The, the nuns as well. So that is so Saint Teresa was was reforming the convents, mm -hmm. and he was reforming the monasteries, right. or starting a, a, a reform movement. And as we can see, how corrupt they were because they kidnapped him and tortured him. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, to try to get him to stop. This is a, a, a sure sign of that kind of corruption. So, anything else, dears? This is wonderful. Brother Shankar? Yes, Bhagavat. There are two or three aspects that I wanted to bring up. Number one, that when you go to a jail, when you suffer a torture, etc., you suffer only if your eyes go off your goal. These are the people whose eyes are only on the goal and nothing else. And therefore, whatever they have to go through does not bother them at all. So number one. Number two, I can relate to what Jenny was talking about, that how can I take such a pain? But that gives me an idea that gradually, 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 our generation becomes more and more intolerant to pain. <clears throat> we have lost our ability to endure. Even upon a little slightest headache or body ache, we rush to the cabinet and get some tablets. But this is not how our culture at that time was. That time when you hear about everyone being thrown to jail, torturing, etc., etc., by that tail, we develop an immunity to the pain also. That immunity is a very important part of a psychological development of mind, and that can be lost if it's not put to test from time to time. And the third thing I wanted to say, that what you said tangentially, if the priests are inflicting torture, then you can see they paid the price for it by gradually, gradually, they losing our trust in them. And that has gone to the maximum extent now that most of the priests and sadhus are not even trusted anymore. They lost their credibility. So these are the two or three points that came to my mind when you told what you told. Thank you, Bhagavad. Thank you for that contribution. Brother Shankara, Amadas here. Yes, Amadas. Um, I had the, a similar reaction to Janaki's at first, like how it doesn't feel attractive to me. Well, I wouldn't necessarily want to sign up for that uh, particular <laughs> level of suffering. And then, then I inverted that and I said, how can I bring that attitude to the suffering that I'm experiencing now, mm -hmm. and how can I how can I map that end of it on? Not inviting greater suffering, but how can I, through greater faith, like Bhagavat said, to keep my eyes focused on the goal, mm -hmm. and let the suffering be whatever the suffering is, because I'm headed to a certain destination. Yes, as we'll hear from as we hear about Sri Ramakrishna. 
it is that absolute unrelenting focus on the goal yep. that makes this possible. Thank you, Amadas. I just wanted to add <clears throat> to, <clears throat> excuse me, um, on the note of suffering and Gandhiji, um, it strikes me going back to Sri Ramakrishna and Holy Mother and Swamiji, the example that they set was so much of our suffering comes from <clears throat> the attachment to the body. And we are, we've become such a materialistic um, society that uh, we are attached to wealth as though, you know, I always think of King Janaka, you know, when he says the whole city is burning but all belongs to God. And, you know, we're suffering, I feel, because we think that this is the end, that this body is the end. <laughs> and we create that suffering because we keep desiring more and more and more. But ultimately, there's, it's not, it's not real. Yes. And we delude ourselves into thinking. Um, and that's what creates that suffering. Because we just yearn for things other than God. Yep. As we'll hear when we hear about Sri Ramakrishna. It was his. What was termed by his guru. The Brahm, by Ravi Brahmani. The woman who came to teach him. It was his madness for God. She said, people are mad for many things, for wealth, for name and fame, for pleasure. She said, you are mad for God. <clears throat> the madness is what we say to some, somebody's mad if they're one pointed, if they're focused. Thank you, Divya, you're right. Thank you. And, you know, it goes back to just what you, you know, it's about love. Yes. And it, when you love, that suffering just melts away. Well, it transforms in any case. Mm. Anything else, dears? Shankaraji, Haryom. Yes, Haryom Balakrishna. I think we have a a, you know, an example in our midst that is mother. She did go through so much of hardships right from the beginning. Even when Ramakrishna was there, she used to live in that uh, Nahabat with such a small space and goes to at two o'clock in the morning before anybody can see her to the Ganges to take the shower and all those are, you know, it, she did go through a lot of hardships. Even after he passed away, she had so much of hardships between her brothers and uh, her niece and all those things. If we really look into her, uh, you know, we don't need any, I mean, of course, all these are examples, but she has the utmost titiksha that she has the endurance for all these difficulties. Yes, mother is another example. And she wasn't brought up this morning because I want to focus on Sri Ramakrishna and the aspect of his sadhana because it so directly applies to uh, this uh, verse from the, uh, from the Devi Mahatmyam where the, the words great inconceivable penances are the means for your realization the realization of the supreme knowledge in the form of the mother, which is not the final realization, but it does store up an immense amount of spiritual treasure that is in the manifest world easy to share uh, for these, for these great ones to share. <clears throat> um just when you were talking about um 
that that Saint that J John of the Cross and Sri Ramakrishna both why did they do these incredible inconceivable penances and you said it was to share because to share with us and I think ultimately that was true but I think for in the beginning or while they're going through these things I don't think that's what's on their agenda I think for both of them like Divya, Divya said about in love it does come down to that because faith and commitment can be very very strong but both of those can be shaken under these dire circumstances like being tortured and or just these different things that they went through and um but love intense love unconditional intense love cannot be shaken it's like a mother who you know that there are stories of a mother lifting a car because to get their child out from underneath it mm -hmm. um that's not you know faith and commitment to a goal are can be very important in our lives but they have that intellectual that left brain component whereas love is the superpower of all superpowers in the universe and Sri Ramakrishna his thing was he just wanted to see mother yes that's what we'll hear and John I don't feel like it was a commitment to his faith. I mean, it was part of it, but I think more than anything, he truly, without any reservations, loved God. And yeah. it was that love, you know, Dr. Mudge was talking about, uh, you know, becoming sort of immune or inured to pain. And I think that um, what enabled, you know, the woman to pick up the car <laughs> or these things to have, or people to, be able to endure these pains is that pure love. Um, even like a, you know, a soldier who's captured and tortured, they may not be particularly religious, but if they are have that sort of soldierly, intense, unconditional love for their country and you know why they're there, you know, it's love is love. It becomes more bearable, yes. Yeah. I think I think the love that you are talking about could be anything which is selfless, which is not necessarily for your personal gain or personal uh, selfish interest. Anything which is larger than you, that kind of goal, that kind of commitment, and when you think of it in those terms, it does not become left brain thing. It becomes your whole body, your whole soul craves for that one thing. <laughs> that one thing must be larger than your own interest, than your narrow interest. And that's why the examples you gave were perfect. Because when, when you think of a soldier, you know, undergoing severe tortures, but not giving up a mother, anybody who loves somebody in a divine way, unselfish way, and commits to a certain goal like Gandhiji did, because he put truth <clears throat> before love and sometimes he equated truth as love and love as truth. So they go, I think, hand in hand. But there's, there's no, about, no doubt about it. You're and, absolutely and Brother right. Shankara, I think that does not come easily to anyone. One must have some previous spiritual disciplines. You know, practice of such spiritual discipline, like fasting, like uh, living in solitude, like letting go certain mind comforts. So step by step, by just like uh, Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, mm -hmm. it has to be cultivated. Yes. Does not come <laughs> just like that. And you have to be passionate about it. So well, that's... 
let's yeah. hear let's hear how Sri Ramakrishna cultivated yes. it and how passionate he was. Yes. So this is about Sri Ramakrishna. And the first subhead is his first vision of Kali. Not yet 20 years old, at the urgent request of the owners of the Dakshineshwar Kali temple, Ramakrishna reluctantly became the priest in charge of Mother Kali's worship. And indeed, he soon discovered what a strange goddess he had chosen to serve. He became gradually enmeshed in the web of her all-pervading presence. To the ignorant, she is, to be sure, the image of destruction, but he found in her the benign, all-loving mother. Her neck is encircled with a garland of heads, and her waist with a girdle of human arms, and two of her hands hold weapons of death, and her eyes dart a glance of fire. But strangely enough, Ramakrishna felt in her breath the soothing touch of tender love, and saw in her the seed of immortality. She stands on the bosom of her consort Shiva. It is because she is the Shakti, the power, inseparable from the Absolute. She is surrounded by jackals and other unholy creatures, the denizens of the cremation ground. But is not the ultimate reality above holiness and unholiness? She appears to be reeling under the spell of wine. But who would create this mad world unless under the influence of a divine drunkenness? She is the highest symbol of all the forces of nature, the synthesis of their antimonies. Yes, antimonies, the ultimate divine in the form of woman. She now became to Sri Ramakrishna the only reality and the world became an unsubstantial shadow. Into her worship, he poured his soul. <clears throat> Before him, she stood as the transparent portal to the shrine of ineffable reality. The worship in the temple intensified Sri Ramakrishna's yearning for a living vision of the mother of the universe. He began to spend in meditation the time not actually employed in the temple service. And for this purpose, he selected an extremely solitary place, a deep jungle, thick with underbr underbrush and prickly plants, lay to the north of the temples. Used at one time as a burial ground, it was shunned by people even during the daytime for fear of ghosts. There, Sri Ramakrishna began to spend the whole night in meditation, returning to his room only in the morning with eyes swollen as though from much weeping. While meditating, he would lay aside his cloth and his brahminical thread. Explaining this strange conduct, he once said to his nephew and assistant, Ridoy, don't you know that when one thinks of God, one should be freed from all ties? From our very birth, we have the eight fetters of hatred, shame, lineage, pride of good conduct, fear, secretiveness, caste, and grief. The sacred thread reminds me that I am a Brahmin and therefore superior to all. Mm -hmm. When calling on the mother, one has to set aside all such ideas. Rido thought his uncle was becoming insane. 
as his love for God deepened, Ramakrishna began to either forget or to drop the formalities of worship. Sitting before the image, he would spend hours singing the devotional songs of great devotees of the mother, such as Kamala Kanta and Ram Prasad. These rhapsodical songs describing the direct vision of God only intensified Sri Ramakrishna's longing. He felt the pangs of a child separated from its mother. Sometimes in agony, he would rub his face against the ground and weep so bitterly that people thinking he had lost his earthly mother would sympathize, would sympathize with him in his grief. Sometimes in moments of skepticism, he would cry, art thou true mother or is it all fiction, mere poetry without any reality? If thou dost exist, why do I not see thee? Is religion a mere fantasy? And art thou only a figment of man's imagination? Sometimes he would sit on the prayer carpet for two hours like an inert object. He began to behave in an abnormal manner, most of the time unconscious of the world. He almost gave up food and sleep left him altogether. But he did not have to wait very long. He has thus described his first vision of the mother. I felt as if my heart were being squeezed like a wet towel. I was overpowered with a great restlessness and fear that it might not be my lot to realize her in this life. I could not bear the separation from her any longer. Life seemed to be not worth living. Suddenly my glance fell on the sword that was kept in the mother's temple. I determined to put an end to my life. When I jumped up like a madman and seized it, suddenly the blessed, suddenly the blessed mother revealed herself. The buildings with their different parts, the temple and everything else vanished from my sight, leaving no trace whatsoever. And in their stead, I saw a limitless, infinite, even effulgent ocean of consciousness. As far as the eye could see, the shining billows were madly rushing at me from all sides with a terrific noise to swallow me up. I was panting for breath. I was caught in the rush and collapsed unconscious. What was happening in the outside world, I did not know. But within there, but within me, there was a steady flow of undiluted bliss, altogether new, and I felt the presence of the Divine Mother. On his lips, when he regained consciousness of the world, was the word Mother. Yet this was only a foretaste of the intense experiences to come. The first glimpse of the Divine Mother made him more eager for her uninterrupted vision. He wanted to see her both in meditation and with eyes open. But the Mother began to play a teasing game of hide and seek with him, intensifying both his joy and his suffering. Weeping bitterly during the moments of separation from her, he would pass into trance and then find her standing before him, smiling, talking, consoling, bidding him be of good cheer and instructing him. He would see flashes like a swarm of fireflies floating before his eyes or a sea of deep mist around him with luminous waves of molten silver. Again, from a sea of translucent mist, 
he would behold the mother rising. Finally, her whole person, he would feel her breath and hear her voice. Worshipping in the temple, he sometimes would become exalted. Sometimes he would remain motionless as a stone. Sometimes he would almost collapse from emotion. Many of his actions, contrary to all tradition, seemed sacrilegious to the people. Like a drunkard, he would reel to the throne of the mother, touch her chin by way of showing her his affection for her, and sing, talk, joke, laugh, and dance. Or he would take a morsel, morsel of food from the plate and hold it to her mouth, begging her to eat it, and could not be satisfied until he was convinced that she had really eaten. Naturally, the temple officials took him for an insane person. <clears throat> His worldly well-wishers brought him to skilled physicians, but no medicine could cure his malady. Many a time he doubted his sanity himself, for he had been sailing across an uncharted sea with no earthly guide to direct him. His only haven of security was the Divine Mother herself. To her he would pray, I do not know what these things are. I am ignorant of mantras and the scriptures. Teach me, mother, how to realize thee. Who else can help me? Art thou not my only refuge and guide? And the sustaining presence of the mother never failed him in his distress or doubt. Even those who criticized his conduct were greatly impressed with his purity, guilelessness, truthfulness, integrity, and holiness. They felt an uplifting influence in his presence. As his spiritual mood deepened, he more and more felt himself to be a child of the Divine Mother. He learnt to surrender himself completely to her will and let her direct him. O oh, mother, he would constantly pray, I have taken refuge in me. Teach me what to do and what to say. Thy will is paramount everywhere and is for the good of thy children. Merge my will in thy will and make me thy instrument. On a certain occasion, Matur Babu, who was the manager of the old temple complex, on a certain occasion, Matur Babu stealthily entered the, table, the temple. On a certain occasion, Matur Babu stealthily entered the temple to watch the worship. He was profoundly moved by the young priest's devotion and sincerity. He realized that Sri Ramakrishna had transformed the stone image into the living goddess. The Divine Mother revealed to me in the Kali temple, it was she who had become everything. She showed me that everything was full of consciousness. The image was consciousness, the altar was consciousness. The water vessels were consciousness. The door sill was consciousness. The marble floor was consciousness. All was consciousness. I found every si everything inside the room soaked, as it were, in bliss. I clearly perceived that all this was the Divine Mother. The manager of the temple, temple garden wrote to Matu Babu saying that I was feeding the cat with the offering intended for the Divine Mother. 
but Mathur Babu had insight into the state of my mind. He wrote back to the manager, let him do whatever he likes. You must not say anything to him. <clears throat> One day, he was meditating in the Panchavati when he saw come out of him a red-eyed man of black complexion, reeling like a drunkard. Soon there emerged from him another person of serene countenance, wearing the ochre cloth of a sannyasi and carrying in his hand a trident. The second person attacked the first and killed him with the trident. Thereafter, Sri Ramakrishna was free of the burning pain that had plagued him for a long time. There's, an, there's another portion to this, but it's getting late enough, I'm going to skip the portion about the Bhairavi Brahmani, his, his woman guru, and simply remark that she taught him what he needed to know and reassured him that he was not insane, that what he was experiencing was the, were the indications of his divine being as an incarnation of God. About five years after this incident, these incidents with her, it was revealed to him that in a short while, many devotees would seek his guidance. One of these devotees was Narendranath Datta, who later became Swami Vivekananda. The Swami wrote this about Sri Ramakrishna. Now this is what is what I mean by when these great ones have finished their penances, if they remain in an embodied form. They remain in order to share their spiritual treasure with us. And here's what Swami Vivekananda wrote about Sri Ramakrishna. It could, it could apply to any incarnation of God. Breaker of this world's chain, we adore thee whom all men love. Spotless, taking man's form, O purifier, thou art above the gunas three. Knowledge divine, not flesh, thou whom the cosmos wears, a diamond at its heart. Let us look deep in thine eyes. They are bright with the wisdom of God that can wake us from Maya's spell. Let us hold fast to thy feet, treading the waves of the world to safety. O oh, drunk with love, God, drunken lover, in thee all paths of all yogas meet. Lord of the worlds, thou art ours, who wert born a child of our time, easy of access to us. O oh, merciful, if we take any hold upon God in our prayer, it is by thy grace alone since all thine austerities were practiced for our sake. How great was thy sacrifice, freely choosing thy birth in this prison, our iron age, to unchain us and set us free. Perfect, whom lust could not taint, nor passion nor gold draw near, O master of all who renounce, fill our hearts 
full of love for thee. Thou hast finished with fear and with doubt, standing firm in the vision of God, refuge to all who have cast fame, fortune, and friends away. Without question thou shalt trust us, and the world's great sea in its wrath seem shrunk to the puddle that fills a hoofprint in the clay. Speech cannot hold thee nor mind, yet without thee we think not nor speak. Love who art partial to none, we are equal before thy sight. Take her away of our pain, we salute thee though we are blind. Come to the heart's dark cave. Oh, come to the heart's dark cave. Come to the heart's dark cave and illumine the light of the light. So this is one of Vivekananda's highest declarations about the nature, the being, the purpose of Sri Ramakrishna. And for that matter, as he says in his talk, Christ the Messenger, of all these great incarnations of God that come from time to time to offer us the result of their great inconceivable penances. So that's the end of this week's talk. Next week's talk is somewhat in, a, in the spirit of fun titled Itty Bitty Austerities. Because of the presence of these great incarnations and what they've left for us, we may win through, we may succeed in the purpose of spiritual life, our freedom, our complete happiness and bliss without having to endure these great inconceivable penances, but only some relatively minor austerities, essentially following some instructions. So now it's time for us to share our thoughts again. Anything from anyone about what you heard? Brother Shankara, I had a question. Um, yes, dear. Uh, I had one question about um, Sri Ramakrishna's vision where he saw everything as uh, permeated by consciousness uh, in his meditation. My question is, it wasn't in meditation, his eyes were wide open. He had been okay. doing the worship of the mother. And, All right. and uh, his eyes were wide open. And uh, uh, he had fed the cat with some food that he that was intended for the mother, which of course was highly objectionable in, under the circumstances, traditionally but it was because he was seeing everything as consciousness. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so thanks for that uh, correction. Um, my question was um, that on the one hand, it is held that everything is bound by the law of causality. So everything is, so we do not have, for example, um, so in theological terms, we can say that it is God's will that determines everything or, um, in scientific terms, one may say that everything is determined by the past. 
Uh, on the other hand, um, it is also held that consciousness is free from the bounds of um, causality. So um, when uh, Ramakrishna experienced everything that is supposedly bound by causality to be consciousness, how do I reconcile uh, these two perspectives? Sri Ramakrishna said it this way. He used many metaphors, but this is perhaps one of the most powerful. Water still and water in waves. Water being consciousness. Water still, Brahman, Nirguna, Nirguna Brahman. No, no manifestation. The guna is in perfect equilibrium. And then Saguna Brahman. Same Brahman, same consciousness. But as Vashishta said to Rama, all that you experience is nothing more. And experience is within causality, time, space, and causation. All that you experience is nothing more than a vibration of consciousness. It is the magic of the magician. So, same consciousness, which uh, Sri Ramakrishna described this realization, actual realization of this. We can have the intellectual idea, but then when we assimilate it and really make it our own, it's a realization that he called that state of awareness at that point. Vigyana, special mm. knowledge, above above the, the the teachings or realizations of jnana. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. In relation to um, Indrajit's question, mm -hmm. um, I always find it. I love thinking about that too, um, because. Mm -hmm. You know, it's what Sri Ramakrishna said about God is the ocean and we are the wave. Mm -hmm. Or God is the Ganga and we're a wave in the Ganga. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then what Swamiji says, matter is not more real than mind. Mind is matter in a higher state, um, in a higher state of vibration, essentially. Mm-hmm. Precisely. And so the consciousness, the consciousness then is everything because he saw that whether it's the cat or the vessel or, you know, even himself, it was the clay. Yes. And then the form, but then he saw the clay, he saw God's clay. And, you know, the question of free will, it, it really, that was a wonderful question because it made me think of um, time, space, and causation. And, um, you know, where is man's free agency if it's not, we always hear, oh, mind over matter. Okay. But then even beyond that, it's the soul over mind because mm -hmm. God is free and, you know, the soul is God. Mm -hmm. Well, Indrajit mentioned the scientific aspects of this. If you go to the writings of a man named Don Lincoln, PhD, who's head of the Fermi lab and okay. is one of the principal researchers at the CERN facility in Switzerland, you will find that he says without qualification that physicists have determined that everything without exception, everything without exception is vibrating fields of different, we call them particles or waves, mm -hmm. uh, but it is nothing, an, an electron, he said, is nothing more than a localized vibration 
of the electron field, a localized special vibration. So that, and so what is vibrating? Well, recently in uh, Scientific American, the, an article appeared. The title of the article was a question, is the universe pervaded by consciousness? Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, it, it, it looks like the physicists and certainly Schrodinger, the, the quantum physicist uh, who wrote the little book, What is Life? came to the conclusion that consciousness is life. Yeah. Yes. And just to think of Swamiji's thought experiment, um, mm. I forget in which book, but he talks about, you know, if you shut off the lights in a room and you, um, you know, charge iron, a piece of yes. iron, first it will, um, you know, flare up in the room and then it'll completely disappear. And that vibration of the, those particles, it's incredible how he thought about that. Well, he, 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 he saw <clears throat> uh, quantum physics coming. He talks about it, uh, he gestures toward it, even mentioning the word particles in, mm -hmm. in his talks in Jnana Yoga. And certainly, he's the one who told Nikola Tesla, you know that energy and matter are the same. He said this to Tesla, he knew Tesla well. He said, you know this from your research and from your findings, you know that energy and matter are the same. Now do the mathematics to prove it. Mm -hmm. And so that, that uh, was never done by Tesla. He never found the time or inclination. But, but interestingly, is, oh, he sorry. wrote a letter. He wrote a letter to Mrs. Einstein, in which he described Swami Vivekananda giving him that challenge. And it wasn't so very many years later that that very eloquent occasion, proving the identity of matter and energy, E equals M C squared, appeared from. Albert Einstein. And there's no proof that there's a direct connection. But it certainly is an interesting finding that Tesla wrote in, Mrs., in a letter to Mrs. Einstein of but, Swamiji's challenge to create the mathematics that proved energy and matter are the same. Then here's my question, if I may just follow up on that very quickly. Because I always wonder this about mathematics, because uh, I've always been terrible at math. But you know, <laughs> so much, so much. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I, but then I always, you know, I I see the physical aspects of things in poetry. Like you see the image and you see the idea, but mm -hmm. then it always seems that you you know people say, well, prove it with the math. But you can see it like with Sri Ramakrishna, he was he was terrible at math too, I remember. At one yeah. point he said that. And he said, you know, my head hurts from all of these <laughs> theories and equations at one point in the in the Katamit. And um and um I just I find it so interesting, you know, how we think about mathematics and the work it's supposed to do is all. What you're talking about is seeing the meaning in things is a is a heartfelt or intuitive or right mind uh, grasp of reality. Mathematics is a very deliberate attempt to create a language without ambiguity. It is it is pure language and uh, properly uh, done and properly understood, mathematics is a language without ambiguity. Now it can be fudged like anything else. Uh, and I don't know math well enough to understand what John Dobson meant by it. Ah. But John Dobson remarked, who did understand mathematics well enough to make this statement, 
that some of the statements of the uh, physicists, particularly around the Big Bang and so on, uh, that, that their mathematics were fudged. And uh, if you want to know more about that, you can read his, uh, his treatise uh, given as a paper at uh, a major uh, scientific slash spiritual con conference. And the title of the paper is The Equations of Mind. Thank you. Can I, uh, please tell me the name of the scientist again. His name is John Dobson, D-O-B-S-O-N. Okay. And uh, he was a chemist. He was trained as a chemist at the University of Berkeley, went on to become an astronomer and then an astrophysicist. And uh, <clears throat> the, the name of the paper uh, is The Equations of Maya which I think you can find online. If you don't find it, just send me an email. I'll send you a copy. It is online. I found it. Um, Very good. Uh, yeah. One follow-up question that I had, because you mentioned so much of information, um, interesting information, is that um, like currently, uh, like physicists are thinking about uh, how quantum mechanics can be merged with uh, the theory of relativity and how it can be applied to gravity. And they find many, they encounter many questions where uh, consciousness appears to um, play a uh, befuddling uh, factor. Like they don't really understand the theory properly um, yes. because, they, yeah. So we can make experimental predictions based on the theory for current experiments, but when they try to apply to the whole universe, then they uh, come across difficulties. Well, of course they do. I mean, it, it, we're not going to solve, ever, we're not ever going to solve with the finite mind and the tools of the finite mind, the operations of the infinite. Swami mm -hmm. Vivekananda is very clear about that. Yes. In chapter, in chapter three of Jnana Yoga, very clear. I think he said something like the universe is the finite wrecking up on the, no, the universe is the infinite wrecking up on the shores of the finite. Mm -hmm. And he said, we are infinite dreamers. We are infinite dreamers, dreaming finite dream. Yes. And this goes back to the thing of math because, I mean, it's supposed to be this exact language, but I think what Sri Ramakrishna was indicating at it seemed to me was even this is a language and when you think of an equation like x y these are variables that are really ultimately um speculative even just like philosophy you know uh or language it's a, trying to approximate through language that which is ultimately as you say infinite and, yes. and I, I do not understand mathematics well enough to, uh, to say more than what I've said. I mean, uh, it, 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 but I do know from having spoken to people who do understand it, that it is a, a language that strives to eliminate ambiguity so that it is, so that when something is communicated uh, as well as mathematics can communicate it. It is communicated very eloquently and without ambiguity. That's all I can really say. And, and, and I admire that and so did Vivekananda. Yes. Now, is it possible to um, use this uh, perspective from um, like um, Vivekananda's philosophy or I don't know if you should attribute it to Vivekananda, but, but this philosophy, which is different from, let's say, the materialistic philosophy, uh, which is uh, presumed in science. If I apply this philosophy instead, then is it possible to understand, for example, uh, quantum mechanics uh, in a new light or in maybe better? Oh, dear. Uh, I, I, you're, you're above my paycheck here. I just, I, I don't know. Sri Ramakrishna said, 
come close to God, come into the neighborhood of God, and all, all ambiguities, paradoxes, problems resolve themselves. His solution, as was Jesus Christ's solution, was no God know the divine, do the spiritual practices necessary to purify your ability to perceive to the point where what you perceive is the reality. Call it what you will. What did, what did Christ say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all else shall be added unto you. Thank you. So the 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 desire to understand intellectually is an admirable one but it is a limited one the idea the the uh, the aspiration to realize the truth spiritually is not limited. It has the virtue and the and the glory of being unlimited. And uh, to understand what I mean by that, read chapter four of Swami Vivekananda's Raja Yoga. First read the introduction, then read chapter four. You can read the rest of it if you like, but definitely read the preface and introduction and then read chapter four. Okay, and you'll, you. you'll see what at least Vivekananda had to say about what it really is to realize or understand God, the spiritual, the reality. Anyone else? This is wonderful. Amadas. Uh, here, it, this reminds me of, um, I understand, and I've actually seen a couple of the uh, symposiums that the Dalai Lama participates in mm -hmm. on neurology at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And, and he, do, it's, he, he calls it a hobby of his. He's very well read. He's a scholar on neurology. Mm -hmm. And he brings the spiritual approach to neurology because he can speak in the same language that the other PhDs understand and use and he says things like and how we handle that in Buddhism is and brings the spirituality to the scholarly conversation of neurology mm -hmm. and it's it's it sounds very similar to what you were saying you know um seek ye the the kingdom of God and then all things will come unto you oh yes exactly but the, 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 if we want to understand what God has created, Sri Ramakrishna says, get to know God, then you understand. Mm -hmm. Then you understand in a way that is not at all possible, simple and simply intellectually. Somebody else started to speak at the same time as Amadas. Yeah, well, it was Keith. Hey, Brother Shankar. Yes, Keith. To start with, wonderful, as usual. Um, appreciate you so much been so helpful um, since since I've come to this community. Um, just awesome. Um, with that said, you know, I'm always trying to read something and I know it's probably, you know, not necessarily going to get me, get me to, to God or whatever, but these are the, the, the many steps I have to take um, in order to kind of, you know, push me a little bit further. I'm looking for some, something comprehensive on Kali and Kali and um, Shiva. Is there anything you can recommend for me? There's a book called Kali the Mother. Uh, there is a, uh, an, uh, it's by Usha, and I don't remember her last name. It's a wonderful book. Uh, there is a book called In Praise of the Goddess uh, by Devadatta, D-E-V-A-D-A-T-T-A, -T -T -A, Devadatta Kali in praise of the goddess. 
<clears throat> that uh, will give you a lot of the information you just talked about, about Kali and about Shiva and about the nature of consciousness itself um, in praise of the goddess by Devadatta Kali. Awesome. I'm sorry, just one last thing. Um, just wanted to say how, again, joining this community, I, I, I'm still not doing everything I need to do, but the beauty of it is this community and my studies have, have always have a voice in my head saying, you know what you're doing, right? <laughs> you know you shouldn't be doing this, right? Or you know this is not leading you to your higher self. And with that voice always there for me now, it's it's almost like um, Ram Dass talks about how once you get on the path, try to fall off if you want. You, you just can't because once you're on, you're on. And um, thrilled to be on. It's 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 an interesting journey. It's good. It's uh, I won't say bad, but it's challenging. Um, but so appreciative of all of you. Um, you add to me probably weekly. Well, excellent, uh, Keith. That's wonderful. The the idea is, you know, this use you you just talked about discrimination. You know, the fact that there's this voice now that's awakened you, which is called buddhi, buddhi, b-u-d-d-h-i, buddhi. This voice in you that is awake and, and is constantly reminding you. And what is it that we really need to just have it remind us of? What deserves my attention? If I am a spiritual aspirant, does this particular thought, this particular conversation, this particular way of speaking, this particular way of acting, does it deserve my attention? And uh, it doesn't, if you, you, you may, as Ramda said, you can go ahead and, and do these other things and see if you can fall off the path. But once you get started, no, you, you'll step off but you'll step right back on. simply because the other is less satisfying. You, know, you, you, you go and you taste it again and you think, hmm, it just has lost its savor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, dear. Uh, may I share a memory of, uh, what is it name, Dobson? Um, John Dobson. John Dobson. That name was not coming until <laughs> you spoke. Uh, I distinctly remember two or three times that I heard him. He used to come to our center here. Yes, he was a very dear friend of Yogesh And Yogesh And one sentence, if I remember correctly, what he said about... Uh, quantum physics mm -hmm. and Vedanta, that though their methods are different, they converge at the end. Mm -hmm. And they point in the same direction. Yes. And almost they are close at the end because the truth they come up with is the same. And, and that was, and he was very funny also. <laughs> very jovial oh yes yes very oh yes. Jovial. well one of the things that john dobson did was start an organization called the sidewalk astronomers oh yes yes and uh, he loved it in this very jovial way that you talked about yes, yes. he loved to share the heavens with people <laughs> and so he himself built out of very inexpensive materials yeah very yeah, good telescopes, hard very hard good hard telescopes, hard. all the way from little ones to great big ones. Yeah. And he would teach you how to do it. Yeah. And uh, the sidewalk astronomer still exists. Yeah. It is outlived him, which is the proof of something's usefulness. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> there are still people teaching you how to um, build your own telescope. I see. Or a really good telescope for less than a hundred dollars. We used to call him science, uh, scientific sadhu. <laughs> yes. 
But like I say, he and Yogeshananda were dear, dear friends. Thank you. Anything else from anyone? All right, dear ones. <clears throat> um, no great inconceivable penances are not expected of us. Uh, nothing is expected of us. We are invited to consider the possibility of itty bitty austerities. And if we do uh, accept the invitation, then Sri Ramakrishna says, practice just a little and someone will come forward to help you. And if you uh, read the, the uh, testimony of the saints, as it is recorded in that great book, Love Poems from God, you'll see of these 12 saints, they all offer to you know, reach right through time, space, and causation and touch your heart and touch your mind. So we'll talk a little about that next week. And for those of you who enjoy um, reading and discussing poetry, uh, tomorrow night we will have our reading and discussion group about that book, Love Poems from God. We're currently discussing, we just finished Rumi, and uh, discussing the poems of Rumi that are in the book, and we're discussing the work of Meister Eckhart, uh, a, a remarkable Christian Catholic mystic. And then on Tuesday evenings, we study the life of Holy Mother. Um, and uh, Balakrishna remarked on what we're finding as we study the life of Holy Mother, just what a spiritual power she was, why. And then on Wednesday evenings, we're studying Swami Vivekananda's Jnana Yoga. We're just about to start chapter four. So, and then on Saturday mornings at 11, we, we um, are working our way through a wonderful, wonderful book of Swami Prabhavananda's talks called Realizing God, collected as a book called Realizing and then the next Sunday, we'll talk about itty bitty austerities. Any last thoughts from anyone? I was so glad you all joined us this morning. Let there be peace in all of outer space. Let there be peace in the sky, on the earth, and in the waters. Let there be peace in the herbs the plants and the trees. May the gods be peaceful. May the whole universe be pervaded by peace. <clears throat> Let this infinite universal peace prevail throughout my being. Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. And in the final salutation, Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai, Durga Durga Durga. May you go forward in mother's loving and protective embrace. May you be safe, may you be healthy, may you be cheerful. And may you have peace of mind. Any last thought from anyone? All right, dears. Until Hari Om. Hari Om. Hari Om. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Bye.